Good morning to you all. This morning's lengthy reading is from Acts, chapter 17, verses 16 through 32. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the, Athen uh, sorry, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the uh, Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very things you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The gods who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in the temples built by human hands. He is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone in life the breath, sorry, everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would not so sorry god did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him although he is not far from any one of us for in him we live and move and have our being as some of your own poets have said we are his offspring therefore since we are god's offspring we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this by, to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered and others said, we want to hear you again on the subject. Here ends this morning's reading. Well, that's not my sermon. <laughs> we definitely read the wrong scripture then. Huh. Sure, we'll get things sorted out. Well, good morning to you all. Uh, if you are a visitor to King of Prussia, uh, I want to first preface this by saying that uh, I am not the normal preacher or minister here. So if by chance you don't like what I say or I don't do a good job, please don't take that out on the church. It's not their fault. Uh, I'm just filling in today. So, and, uh, and, you know, I know the scripture was, was a little bit long, but I actually... You know, I thought it was actually much shorter. The, the actual passage is Acts 17, 15 through 34. I actually cut out three whole verses. So, you're welcome. It is funny, though. I did think I was listening. I'm going, man, that was, that was really long. Didn't seem that long when I was first looking at it, but did an excellent job reading it. All right. I think we're still getting things sorted out here. So one other thing, uh, this is actually my first time preaching here at King of Prussia. I've done this one time before. I, uh, I preached one time at uh, Camp College and uh, was able to deliver a message there 
relatively, uh, relatively easy. I guess I did a good enough job that my dad thought, yeah, you could do it at King of Prussia. But I was a little nervous last night. I didn't know kind of how long it was going to take. Anyone that's ever prepared a sermon, Matt, I don't know if you had this problem, but you get a lot of content and you start going, I don't know how long this is going to take. I've never done this before. And so my dad was like, well, you know, do a run through, practice it a few times, make sure that, you know, you can kind of get a sense of the flow and all that stuff. And uh, so I tried doing that, but, uh, you know, I tend to, to be a, a constant editor. So as I read through something, I go, well, I'm going to change this. I'm going to change that. And, and then I never actually do a run through because I keep changing things as I go. So finally last night, very, very late, I said, okay, I'm going to do, I'm going to do a run through. And I fell asleep in the process of doing it. <laughs> so all I can tell you with absolute certainty is that my sermon is longer than a minute, okay? And it's probably shorter than six hours. <laughs> Somewhere between a minute and six hours. That's the, that's the time frame we're working with here. So. so what I'd like to do to start things off today is I would actually like us to uh, kind of do an exercise, a mental exercise, so to speak. Um, and uh, it's pretty straightforward. I'm just going to ask you some questions, get some feedback from you, and that's, that's how we'll, we'll jump things off here. <coughs> All right. First question. First off, I just want to point out, this is a bucket list that I've, item that I've just checked off. I have incorporated this person into a sermon, so I'm making progress. So my question is, who is this person? You can shout it out. It's okay. Superman. Superman. All right. All right. <laughs> Absolutely right. That's how you know you're raising a good kid. <laughs> so there was a pretty loud response, but how confident are you that that's Superman? On a scale of 1 to 10, if you're very confident, raise your hand. Very confident. Okay, well, you're correct. It is Superman. Now, throw this up a little bit. What's the name of his alter ego? Clark Kent. Clark Kent. Okay, a little less response, but how confident are you in that response? If you're very confident, raise your hand. I'm about the same. All right, good. Well, you're right. Four score and seven years ago, what is this the opening statement to? Gettysburg. Gettysburg Address. Okay. How confident are you? If you're very confident, raise your hands. It's good to see all the kids raising their hands. That's very reassuring. Your tax dollars at work. E equals MC squared. What is this the calculation of? Theory of relativity. Okay. How confident are you? If you're very confident, raise your hand. All right, good. Public education's not as bad as they say. Let's try the next one. Make it a little bit, make it a little more challenging. What's the name of this symbol? Uh-oh. Okay, what's the symbol called? No idea, okay. Does anyone have any guess? Not quite, not quite, but Hey, good shot. Okay, we'll ask a different question. What, uh, what person is this symbol associated with? Well, technically, yes. I guess everything's about Jesus. But uh, more specifically, historical figure. Jesus was a historical figure. But another person besides Jesus. Who is this? Who? Okay. Anyone else? Not so much. How confident are you? How confident are you, actually? Very confident? How about everyone else? How confident are you? Do you even know the answer to this? If you don't know the answer, I'm going to put you on the spot. Raise your hand. Okay, fair enough. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible. This is the opening statement to what? A creed, okay. Which creed? <coughs> Not the band creed. That would be awful. <laughs> So throwing some things out there. How many of you are confident that you know the answer to this? Okay, much, much fewer. All right, lastly, scripture, tradition, experience, reason. This is the uh, methodolog uh, methodological uh, system for what type of theological inquiry? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> No one even is trying to answer that one. Well, this is actually, I'm just going to jump ahead on this one. This is called the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. This is actually a, a, a theological system that um, 
Methodists use, uh, Anglicans use it as well. It's how they go through scriptural uh, analysis. That's the kind of the process of interpreting scripture and, and gaining their theological understanding. So um, why are we more confident in our answers for the first three slides? You don't have to answer that. Just something to think about for a moment. Why do we know more about the first three slides than the second three slides? Well, the reality is there's some pretty straightforward answers about it. I'm not trying to catch you guys off guard or, you know, say, aha, I got you on anything. Uh, you know, the reality is pretty straightforward. Um, the first three things that we looked at, you know, Superman, uh, Gettysburg Address, you know, things like that, those are things that are referenced in movies, right? We see them in literature, we see them in television, things like that. Um, we clearly learn about them in school. We don't learn about Superman. That's ridiculous, but whatever. And um, they're just kind of part of the cultural DNA of our society, right? We just kind of know these things. We don't necessarily know where we learned them, how we learned them. We just know that we, we know them, right? It's part of who we are. Why aren't we as confident in the second three slides? Well, the reality is, and it's totally understandable, we probably don't think that it's that important, right? Or that necessary. I mean, it makes sense that non-Christians don't know that stuff. Why, why would they need to? You know, it's not really crucial to them. It's not part of their lives. But we're Christians. We're a body of believers. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We understand that who we are is in direct correlation to who we have been as a people. So why don't we know more about our culture? And like I said, the reality is, in a lot of ways, most churches and most Christians just don't think that that kind of information is that important. Who cares if I know about ecumenical councils or you know, the, uh, the emperor from Byzantium or how Methodists engage in theological inquiry, right? Well, there's a saying in business that what matters gets measured, right? If something's important to an organization, uh, they monitor it. They have eyes on it at all times. So the question is, what does the church measure? What are the things that we look at that are important to us. Well, if you look in your bulletin, you, you see a few of those things. We measure attendance, right? So we check to see how many people are here on a given week. We see how we're kind of tracking year to date. We kind of compare to previous years. We also track contributions, right? That's obviously very important. We want to see how we're doing in terms of meeting our budget, meeting our financial obligations, things like that. To a certain extent, we also kind of gauge worship. We think that worship was exciting or vibrant or that there was a lot of good singing. Those are things that we look at, you know, and we try and, and we use that to kind of assess the strength of the church. And some churches even look at things like baptisms, the number of missions that they do, the number of programs that they have available. I actually went to a church out in California before I moved out here that they, they literally tracked baptisms. And they use that as a, as a performance metric in a lot of ways, saying, well, at this time last year we only had, you know, 10 baptisms, and this year we have 15, so that's doing well, right? So those are some of the things that we look at. The trap is, though, it's easy to fall into a line of thinking where we look at some of these things and we go, well, high attendance, high contributions, you know, vibrant worship, uh, lots of baptisms, but that means that the church is doing well. And then the inverse of that is also true, that you know, if our church attendance is maybe not where we'd like it to be, if contributions are down a little bit, maybe it's been a while since we've had someone come to get baptized, and we think, well, maybe things aren't going so well at the church at this point in time. But how often do we evaluate things in our churches like scriptural proficiency? How often do we gauge how well uh, our members, you know, the, the aptitude that they have in apologetics, theological reasoning. How much do we measure to see how much people know about their church history? How much do they know about where they come from, why they believe the things that they believe? Well, there was a point in time in the church when we actually did. In the time of the Puritans and the Pilgrims, there was a much larger focus on comprehensive Christian education. You weren't just required to know what you believe, you were also expected to know why. You had to be able to give a testimony, to be able to defend your faith if called upon. Faith was just as much an intellectual endeavor as it was a spiritual or emotional one. 
I'm give you a kind of a short history lesson here. By the 1800s, though, that began to shift around the time of the Second Great Awakening. What happened was the church, in all of its zeal, was so intent on getting people to convert that they were overemphasizing conversion. And as a result, they kind of neglected to focus on the intellectual aspects, people understanding why they believed the things that they believed. As a result, people were poorly equipped to respond, and many churches kind of retreated from the public sphere when they were challenged by the world around them. Today's church has continued to be challenged by a watered-down and misunderstood gospel. And we've placed so much emphasis on matters of the heart that it is neglected to exercise and engage the mind. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. So recently, uh, I've started reading a book by a guy by the name of J.P. Moreland. He's a theology professor at Biola University. It's called Love Your God With All of Your Mind. And it actually looks at this issue, this issue of kind of anti-intellectualism that has been impacting the church. This idea that we have a lot of people coming to church, we have a lot of people that profess to be Christians, and yet when it comes time for people to stand up and be counted, those numbers tend to be a lot smaller. People don't seem to have as much confidence. They don't seem to kind of show up when, when the world challenges us. And so he was looking at that, and he identified a number of different impacts that anti-intellectualism has had on the church. The first one is that there's been a misunderstanding kind of a faith's uh, relationship to reason. Today, faith is largely viewed as a blind act of will. It's a decision to believe something that's independent of reason or something that is simply a choice to believe despite the evidence. How many of you think of faith like that? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but think about how often you actually think about when you think about your faith. I'm wording that horribly. I apologize. Biblically speaking, though, faith is a power or a skill to act in accordance with the nature of God. It's a trust in what we have reason to believe is true. And we see examples of that in Matthew chapter 9. There's three really solid examples. When Jesus heals the paralyzed man, when he, the woman touches Jesus' cloak, and when Jesus heals the blind. In all three of those examples, there was an act of faith on their part. These people believed that what they had heard was reasonable, that it could be true. And they acted on that faith, and as a result, their faith proved to be true. The second impact is that there's been a separation of the secular and the sacred worlds. Religion has largely become a personal and a private endeavor, and something that, that shouldn't kind of intrude into the public sphere. And uh, largely, religion has become a matter of simply how we feel about things, right? We treat it like a, an all-you-can-eat buffet of spirituality. You go and you kind of pick and choose the things that you like, and that's what you believe, and, and that's okay. And we see that a lot, particularly among our younger generations. If you talk to younger kids and you ask them what they believe, you hear a lot of different responses. They'll say things like, well, you know, I like this, I like that. You know, and they kind of combine things in just this amalgam of their own belief system. There's no necessarily uh, logical consistency to the things that they believe. There was a recent article I was reading where it was actually looking at... Uh, 10 signs that religious fundamentalism is in decline. And it was actually looking on this you know, in a positive way, saying this is a good thing. And uh, one of the signs that the author pointed to was this very thing, this buffet-style religious expression, where people are just kind of picking and choosing and modifying uh, their faith as they see fit. And uh, she writes, many younger people are casting aside labels and adopting what fits from religious holidays and traditions in the same way that they mix and match cultural, racial, and sexual identities. So religion is just whatever you feel. If this works for you, go ahead and do it. Doesn't matter really if it's true or not. Just go and do what, what pleases you. The challenge is because everyone's feelings are equally valid, we live in a world where we can't say conclusively that one set of beliefs is more right than another. We're encouraged to use our intellect in our personal lives, you know, in our vocation, in our finances, things like that. But when it comes to matters of religion, when it comes to matters of faith, what we believe, things that are transcendent, everyone just says, well, just go with your heart. It's okay. Just kind of figure it out as you go. Make it up if you have to. The third impact that uh, J.P. Moreland writes about is that anti-intellectualism has spawned an irrelevant gospel. 
says that the gospel is primary used, uh, primarily used as a means of addressing felt needs. Be a better parent, you know? Overcome depression, uh, create wealth. If you've ever watched Joel Osteen, this is pretty much part and parcel of, of his entire ministry. You know, he doesn't dig into scripture that much, but he'll tell you how much that if you, you know, read your Bible, that this will happen, this will happen. X will then result in, you know, this, uh, this circumstance. The problem is by this approach, the gospel is only relevant to people if we perceive or accept that we have needs. So in my case, I'm not a parent. So I don't really need to worry about reading scripture to be a better parent. I'm, you know, I have student loans, so I'm never going to have wealth, so I don't have to worry about that either. And I'm a pretty happy person, so I don't really have to worry about depression. So for me, if those are the felt needs that people are trying to overcome with the Bible, it's not really relevant to me. So why should I bother if I don't have any needs? Another problem is that the validity of the gospel message is not dependent on whether or not the gospel message is true, but on whether or not those felt needs are sufficiently addressed. So if you come to church thinking, well, if I come to church and if I read my Bible, that that's going to help me overcome my depression, and your depression doesn't get better, well, now the validity of the gospel is in question. It didn't help me. If you think that reading the Bible and having a relationship with Jesus Christ means that you will amass wealth, but you don't become rich, perhaps the gospel message isn't valid. If the gospel message is true and reasonable to believe, then everyone has a need for Christ, regardless of whether we feel that need or not. And unfortunately, that's not the emphasis that's placed in a lot of churches. The fourth and final impact that uh, Moreland writes about, he says that there has been a loss of boldness in confronting our culture with effective Christian witness. When people lack knowledge, when they lack confidence, in their beliefs, they shy away from the places in which their testimony is needed most. At my job, we, uh, we just launched a new product. And um, I actually work with our vendor, and we haven't trained them on this new product. So I'm very unfamiliar with it. And the other day, we were getting hit with really high call volume. I work in a call center. And so my boss asked me if I could jump in and take calls. And I was, you know, OK to do it, but I was really hesitant to do it. I was like, are you sure you want me to do that? Because I wasn't prepared. I wasn't confident in the information. I didn't feel like I could, you know, jump into that and do a good job and be able to, to get through the situation as well. And we see that a lot in our churches. People say, well, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that he's the son of God. And you say, well, why? It gets really quiet. It's easy to look at the challenges facing the church today and become discouraged or think that this is some new obstacle that the church is facing. The reality, though, though, which should provide some encouragement to us, is that this is not something that's new. It's really not. It's really just a different iteration of obstacles that the church has faced from its very beginnings. So if you have your Bibles, please open them up to the, uh, the lengthy passage that we read, Acts 17, uh, and we'll start 15, verse 34. So the very issues of which I'm speaking were actually ones that Paul faced on his missionary journey. Went too far. So uh, where we're at in Acts, to give you a little bit of context, Paul is in the midst of what is uh, generally known as his second missionary journey. Uh, he's arrived in, uh, in Athens ahead of Silas and Timothy, who he left behind in Berea. And the plan is for them to eventually join him in Athens, and then they'll, they'll move on with their, uh, with their you know, missionary journey. Uh, so Athens is not the political capital of Greece, but it was the cultural capital of the, uh, the ancient world. It was the center of philosophy. So if you wanted you know, to be exposed to, to art and, and all the culture and you know, music, all that stuff that, that the ancient world had to offer, Athens was the place that you went. It was kind of like a modern, you know, uh, ancient uh, New York City, it was kind of that culture. Now, from the text, um, there's no indication that Paul had any plans to evangelize in Athens. And uh, it's also doubtful that he would have been there, you know, that he would have been there long enough to set up his tent making business and try and earn any money. So basically, uh, when we see Paul in Acts 17, uh, 15, he's basically in Athens as a tourist. He's just waiting until Paul and uh, until Timothy and Silas uh, show up and then they can move on. So he's looking around the city and uh, just kind of taking in the sights. And as he's walking around, he is so overcome 
by the idolatry that he sees that he just can't help himself. And you know, it's one of the reasons I, I love Paul. Um, it says in the scriptures that he was provoked. You know, the spirit was provoked to, uh, to in, you know, engage the, uh, the Athenian people. And so he finally sees everything that he sees, and he just gets, he goes, I can't take it anymore. So he winds up going to the synagogue, and he goes to the marketplace. And, and in a lot of ways, Paul's just kind of looking for a fight. Uh, he's really funny in that um, he's just never the kind of guy to pass up the opportunity to, to preach the gospel. He didn't shy away from intellectual discussions. You kind of get the sense that he starts kind of like rubbing his hands together, like, all right, now it's going to get good. Um, in a lot of ways, he's just itching for this conversation. He kind of reminds me of my grandpa Larry in a lot of ways. Um, when my grandpa Larry was alive, if you even gave him an inkling that you wanted to talk about scripture, or there was some theological concept or idea, he would just pull a Bible out. You never knew where the Bible was. He just magically like pulled it out of his pocket. and He'd be like, well, let's talk about it, you know, and he'd just start going through stuff. And, uh, and you'd always kind of regret that to a certain sense, especially if you maybe said something he disagreed with, because he would let you know why you were wrong. And uh, so when I, when I read this passage, when I, think, when I see Paul, I think of my grandpa Larry just, just kind of itching for that fight. So while he's in the marketplace, it says that he's talking you know, to people, just pretty much anyone that would listen. Anyone that wants to engage him in conversation, you know, uh, he goes ahead and you know, he starts that conversation, that dialogue. So while he's there, he winds up getting the attention of, of two groups of people, the Epicureans and the Stoics. Now, uh, to help you know a little bit more about those two groups, um, the Epicureans and the Stoics were actually two of four kind of philosophical groups that had come up uh, in the Athenian culture. And by the time uh, that Paul is in Athens, there's really only two left, uh, and that's the Stoics and the Epicureans. The Epicureans, um, their, uh, their entire ethical theory was based on the idea that pleasure was the chief end in life. That uh, the greatest pleasure of life was one that is uh, tranquil, free from pain, negative thoughts, and superstitious fears. Now, they didn't deny the existence of gods, but they believed that any potential gods were pretty much just ambivalent towards them. And so the Epicureans were very humanistic. They were just very much engaged in what felt good to them, what, what was pleasing to them, what gave them uh, personal satisfaction. Now, the Stoics, on the other hand, the Stoics based their ethical theory on the primacy of the rational faculty in humanity and on individual self-sufficiency. So these were people that were, were highly intellectual people. They were constantly looking at new ideas. They were, you know, kind of always chewing on the meat of, of new ideas in search of truth. That was their thing. And um, theologically, they were pantheistic. They actually believed that the universe and nature was God. You know, so their, their notion of God was, um, was also very, very different. And what's interesting about the Stoics, though, is that they believed that truth could only be determined by the collective judgment of humankind. Something was only true if you had consensus on it. So if you thought something might be the right way to go, you actually had to go to the other Stoic philosophers and you'd actually have to discuss that idea. And if they voted and they said, no, we don't think that's the truth, it wasn't. So it was truth by committee. In other words, as, uh, as many of our politicians these days like to say, truth was evolving. My beliefs on this have evolved. So, so uh, for both groups, Paul's message had uh, really no appeal to them because it flew directly in the face of everything that they believed. Sounds very familiar to kind of the culture that we live in. If you think about secular society, People are very opposed to what Christianity has to offer because it flies in the face of what they want to do, what feels good, and their own uh, assumptions of what truth is. So when these uh, philosophers come to listen to Paul, it's not because they're actually seeking truth. Really, it's more of a show for them. They're looking at this going, I just want to see what the guy says. I don't really buy it. It's basically like watching MSNBC. It's kind of that environment. You know? You're not going to get anything from it, but you watch it just to watch the chaos. And that's kind of what they're doing. As uh, There's a writer named uh, Bob Deffenbaugh, and the way he puts it that I really like is he says, they were always window shopping in the marketplace of ideas, but they were never buying. I think that's, that's a good way of putting it. All right, so uh, if you look at Acts 17.22, it says, um, 
Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. Now Paul does two pretty impressive things as he begins his encounter. The first thing is he establishes some common ground with them. Uh, the altar to the unknown God, something that both he and the philosophers are familiar with. So kind of says, okay, I know, I know what this is, you know what this is, this is kind of where we'll start. The second thing that he does, I think, is actually uh, much more impressive. I think it's one of the best opening statements to a, to a conversation in the Bible. Um, he gets their attention very quickly by paying them a compliment and then accusing them of stupidity right after that. And then, graciously, he offers to correct said stupidity. So typically when you give a speech, they tell you, you know, when you have to have a good opening, you have to have something that catch, you know, catches people's attention. And I'm very confident that if I were to stand up here today and say, you're all stupid and I'm going to help you through it, <laughs> if you stayed, you would at least be engaged. So, so I always appreciate that Paul took that approach. It, just kind of funny. Uh, I think that the, the Bible, if you read it the right way, actually has a lot of humor in it, and that part made me laugh last night. So that could have been sleep deprivation, but what do I know? So then uh, in, uh, in Acts 17, 24 through 28, move it out of the slide, 24 through 28, Paul then explains to them that the God of whom he is speaking is the God who was unknown to them, but whose existence the altar gave testimony. So he has that common foundation. He says, you know, this, un this altar to the unknown God, that you, that you have here. I can actually tell you who that God is. And, and he, so he reveals that, that to them and explains that the God that they had that altar to was actually the God of whom he speaks. And, um, <clears throat> and so what he's doing is he's showing them that by the virtue of the altar's existence, their notions of religion, ethics, culture, and truth are completely inadequate. And that's what he's coming to, to kind of open their eyes to. Uh, furthermore, he declares that if God is unknown to these Athenians, it's not because God has not revealed himself, but rather that it's because people have closed their eyes to his existence and character. He's saying, you seek the truth, and you have this altar here to this unknown God, and that's the God of whom I'm speaking. So if you are seeking the truth and you ignore this altar and you don't recognize what that is, it's not because the truth is not there. So in doing that, uh, if you look in your Bibles in verse 28, um, he quotes two philosophers to validate his assertion. I don't know how many of you in your Bibles have a footnote in verse 28, but show of hands, do any of you have a footnote for verse 28? Some of you do, not all of you? Okay. Well, in some, uh, in some Bibles, you will actually see uh, two footnotes that um, point out that Paul is quoting two philosophers there to kind of make his point. The, uh, the main view that people have about this kind of the general impression is that Paul is quoting uh, these philosophers to show that he's knowledgeable about their beliefs and culture. And he can use that knowledge to speak to the truth of Jesus Christ. But there's something more significant going on that your Bibles will not tell you. And I think it's, it's um, much more significant to the story, and I think it has a much broader impact kind of to the point that, uh, that I'm trying to get to. About 600 years before Paul arrived in Athens, uh, the city of Athens was going through a massive plague. They had been having all sorts of pestilence and drought. Crops were dying. Uh, animals were dying as well. And they couldn't figure out what was going on. And uh, being the polytheistic culture that they were, the Athenians thought, okay, well, we've clearly made one of the gods that we worship mad. So we've got to figure out how to appease them. So their solution was, we're going to make sacrifices to every single god that we have here. And so they did and made sacrifices and thought, in the process of that, we will probably appease the one that's upset, and then we should be good to go. The only problem was, the plague didn't go away. So now the Athenians are sitting there going, well, now what are we supposed to do? We've, we've sacrificed to every god that we know of. What's our solution? So they, uh, they actually reached out to a consultant, a uh, shaman, and uh, brought him into Athens. I wish that, uh, I wish that Steve Kasha was here. He would appreciate the consultant referenced. But so they bring in a consultant to kind of evaluate the work that they've done and see if he can figure out a solution to help end the plague. 
So this shaman looks around and he says, well, yeah, you've sacrificed to every single god and it hasn't, hasn't helped anything. The only logical conclusion is that there is a god that you don't know about whom you've offended. And it's to that god that you need to sacrifice. So, okay, well, if it's a god we don't know of, how are we, how are we supposed to know how to appease that god? So the shaman says, well, here's what you need to do. You need to take some lambs and you need to withhold food from them for a couple of days until they're starving. And once they've reached the point where they are just absolutely clamoring for food, release them onto this pasture. And, uh, and he said, if they run out onto the pasture and they don't eat, but instead they just lay down, then that's where we need to build altars. Because it would be highly unlogical for, uh, illogical for them to run out into a pasture when they're starving and not eat. So the Athenians say, okay, they decide to do that. They do everything that he says. They withhold food from them until they're starving. They release them on the pasture. And sure enough, just like the shaman said, some of the lambs ran out and they didn't eat. But instead, they just laid down in the grass. Also, as the shaman suggested, they then built altars at every place where the lambs had laid down and hadn't eaten food. Shaman then said to him, okay, now that you've built this altar, you need to sacrifice the lambs at the altars that you just built. And he said, and if you do this, the God that you've offended will be appeased and the plague will be lifted. So the Athenians did so. They sacrificed the lambs and sure enough, the next day, the plague was over. So in celebration, in commemoration of this, this significant event in their history, they commemorated all of those altars and they put plaques on them that said, to an unknown God. Over the course of time, though, as tends to happen in civilizations, they forgot the story. They forgot the significance of the event. They forgot about the God who was unknown. A lot of those altars were destroyed. A lot of them just weren't kept up, and so they, they fell apart. But there was one that had survived. There was one that for some reason the Athenians had decided to, to, keep, to keep up. But they didn't pay much attention to it. It was just kind of left there, just kind of existed amongst all the other altars and statues and idols that they had. It was forgotten about until one day a man by the name of Paul came to Athens. Now the reason I mention that story is because in verse 28... Paul quotes a philosopher. He says, for in him we live and move and have our being. And he references this philosopher to show that what he's saying about Jesus Christ is actually confirmed by the philosophers. The name of that philosopher, if you look in your Bible, in verse 28, it's a man by the name of Epimenides. It's a historical figure, actually exists in, in human history, if you, you know, are actually curious in validating that. Epimenides is significant because he was the shaman that had been called in to Athens 600 years earlier. When Paul is quoting Epimenides, he is quoting a man who knew who the unknown God was. And Paul is trying to call them back to that knowledge again. By quoting Epimenides, Paul is tell the, telling the Athenians that everything they know and believe is wrong. That in their ignorance, they had missed the truth that was in front of them the entire time. In verses 29 through 32, if you read, Paul then calls them to make a commitment to the truth of Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the dead. He says, therefore, since we are God's offering, using the same language as in verse 28, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now... He commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Verse 32 then says, When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, We want to hear you again on this subject. Paul is telling them that there's no more time for window shopping. There's no more time for an all-you-can-eat buffet-style spirituality. 
They either accept the truth or they don't. They either have to commit or they don't. That is the option that Paul gives to them. If you read in the scriptures, you'll see that some people believed and were converted. Others did not. The reality is, though, most of them didn't. Paul gave a message of absolute truth. He was able to show them that what they believed was absolutely wrong, that they had misunderstood it all that time. And he showed them what the truth was, but only some of those people chose to accept it. The vast majority just said, <coughs> no, we think he's foolish, and walked away. So some takeaways for us, some lessons learned. The first is that Paul didn't shy away from an intellectual challenge. Paul was learned, he was confident in the truth of Christ's resurrection and God's activity in the world throughout history. The lesson for us is that we must also be prepared to stand for the truth. We have to know what we believe, but more importantly, I think, we have to know why we believe it. We have to be prepared to stand for the truth. The second takeaway, Paul doesn't view the sacred and the secular worlds as being sac uh, separate. God as its creator and Jesus as its savior are present and active in both. When Paul tells the story of, you know, when we learn the story of Epimenides and the altar to the unknown God, what that is showing is that even though that is a secular story, God's activity is working in that story. There's not, there's not human history and Christian history. There is just history, and God is God over it all. And Paul does not accept the notion that those two, that the secular and the sacred, should be separate. So too, we must cease viewing the world as secular and spiritual spheres and live in truth that Jesus is Lord over all, in all, and through all things. The third takeaway. Paul doesn't position his comments as an opinion of the heart to be considered alongside other equally valid viewpoints. He presents them as well-reasoned truth that must either be rejected or accepted. We have to stand confidently to be God's people and proclaim his truth without equivocation. When we talk to people, it shouldn't be, well, you know, this is what I believe, but, you know, if you don't believe it, that's okay, too. You know, but this is what I believe, but, you know, if you don't believe that, that's okay. I don't want to make you mad or anything like that. We have to stand confident and say, no, this is the truth. This is what I believe. This is what I know to be true, and I have good reasons to think so. And we don't do that. And Paul stands there in the midst of an absolutely hostile environment and says, here it is, guys. Take it or leave it. Most of them leave it. But that didn't change the way that Paul presented it. And we have to learn from that example as well. Lastly, Paul is more concerned with the quality of the fruit his message bears than the quantity. Some people believed Paul, but others did not. He doesn't concern himself with those who were given the truth but chose to reject it.